Send your scariest workplace stories to us at eeriecast.com slash submit. And rate and review Tales from the Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Thanks. Hi, welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? Monsters. Everyone has a different definition of what a monster is. Evil people who do terrible things. Supernatural creatures hiding under children's beds. That huge rat by the dumpster outside that got eaten by a somehow larger rat. One thing is certain, well, two things technically, monsters are terrifying no matter the definition, and that dumpster needs inspected with a flamethrower. Today's story features monsters and ghosts, from tall things in the woods to screaming spirits in small towns. Join me for a hot little latte in the back, and I'll tell you some new, true, scary work stories. These are Tales from the Break Room. Do you believe in monsters? From Crone Witch. This story takes place in the second largest city in Iowa. It was 1973, and I was a lithe, 5 foot 8, 120 pound, 20 year old. I lived in a large old two story house with four apartments, two up and two down. My one bedroom apartment was downstairs, and I lived alone. My friends, Steve and Gary, along with their infant daughter, lived upstairs. I'd gone to high school with Steve and had worked in housekeeping with his wife, Gary, in the past. I was employed as a waitress at a steak and brew restaurant. I would work both the lunch and dinner shifts. One sunny spring morning, I was walking to the bus stop to go to work when this massive man materialized from empty air as if summoned by some demons from the depths of the abyss below. Before I could recover from shock and surprise from the sudden appearance of the man, he viciously grabbed me by the forearms and yanked me off the sidewalk. Quickly recovering from my shock, I immediately screamed at him, Let go of me! As he pulled me closer towards his massive chest, my nostrils were hit with the worst mal-odor I've ever experienced. The overpowering stench of him gagged me. He had this stink of putrefaction, urine, filth, body odor, and some unidentified chemical, reminiscent of a chemistry class substance you might encounter in a school science lab. I've never before or since encountered such an utterly disgusting gag-inducing odor. I almost couldn't breathe, it was so repulsive. This coming from me, who has an iron constitution, says a lot. I'm the person you call to clean out the fridge full of rotting food that's been sitting in the 110 degree heat for three months with the power off, because that I can handle. As if his reek wasn't terrifying enough, this man weighed at least 400 pounds and was a good six foot eight. I twisted and turned, but he just gripped my arms ever tighter. Finally, I writhed around so I was facing him and there was my moment of opportunity. If I could get him to loosen his grip on me for a mere millisecond, I might be able to make a break for it, I thought. There was no traffic, no people passing by. I was on my own. He said, You're coming with me, and you're gonna do what I say. Screw you, I said, and I kicked him square in the crotch as hard as I could. <clears throat> he groaned as his grip momentarily loosened on my arms. I wrenched myself away and ran as fast as I could, five blocks to the bus stop. I didn't even look behind me once to see if he was there or following me. I didn't want to see him if he were right behind me. I'd hoped, correctly, that I could easily outrun him due to his extreme size, and I certainly didn't want to slow down to look behind me in case he was there. I was shaking as I boarded the bus to work. When I got to work, the boss and other waitresses asked me what happened. They saw these giant handprints on my arms that clearly defined his huge fingers on my flesh. My skin was already turning awful shades of green, blue, and black. I told them about my encounter on the way to the bus stop. Horrified, they insisted I call the police. But I just wanted to put it behind me and get on with my day. I figured I most likely would never see this random stranger ever again, 
Or at least, that's what I told myself. That night after work, I took the bus back and walked the five blocks home from the bus stop as usual. The large house my apartment was in had a big front door with glass panels on either side of the door frame, and also in the door itself. There was always a light on in the entryway, but the entry door was never locked. My apartment was on the left inside the vestibule, with my neighbor's door directly across from mine, on the opposite side of the stairs, leading to the two apartments on the second floor. I took my keys and let myself in, then closed and locked the door immediately. That was my habit. I had to cross the living room to turn the lights on, then went to close the drapes on the big bay window in the living room. As I did this, the same man who had assaulted me earlier jumped up from the shrubbery by the window and glared at me with pure anger and violence in his expression. My jaw dropped as I jumped away from the window in horror and shock. In a flash, he was in the entryway pounding on my door, shaking it in its very frame. He screamed at me, Let me in! If you don't, I'm going to break it down and have my way with you, and then I'm going to kill you. I was certain the door was going to come off its hinges any moment. It was just a cheap wooden interior door, after all. There was no doubt this monster was capable of breaking it down. I screamed back at him to go away because I was not going to open my door. He kept pounding and yelling that he was coming in anyway if I didn't open the door, throwing more disgusting threats my way, adding that there was no stopping it now. Then he went back outdoors to the front of the house by my bay window and began to bang at it, still screaming. This went on for another half hour, him coming inside, beating on the door, then back outside to my bay window screaming all the while what unimaginable things he had planned to do to me. I could feel and hear his escalating anger. I had no reason not to believe him, because I was completely aware he was capable of doing those things that he threatened, especially killing me. I could hear his rage amping up, and I knew it wouldn't be much longer before he broke down my door and came inside to complete his evil plans for me. Now, I'm sure you're probably thinking, why didn't I just call the police already? That's a good question. You see, I just didn't have a phone. I had no way to call 911 or anyone for help. I was trapped in my apartment like a wild animal caught in a hunter's trap. I felt how livestock must feel upon exiting the chute in the slaughterhouse, knowing death was only moments away. I knew my time was running out. I had to think of something, anything, anything I could do to save myself. I didn't own any actual weapons, so that was out of the question. Besides, the massive difference in size was not exactly conducive to close contact self-defense. What do I do, I wondered. The adrenaline was pumping through my body, every nerve raw as jagged glass and on edge, ready for action. I took some deep calming breaths to try and clear my mind and get some control over this pure terror. The longer I waited, the worse it could be. Suddenly, I had the beginnings of an idea. I thought maybe, just maybe, I could open my bedroom window, which was towards the other side of the house. But what if he was back there waiting for me in the pitch darkness? What if he heard me opening the window, taking out the screen? What if he heard me jumping to the ground into the bushes? The thought of being caught by him outside was just as terrifying as remaining put, which wasn't really an option if I wanted to survive this. But wait, maybe if I made it outside undetected, I might be able to run around to the back of the house. There was a rear stairway there, probably for the household help back in the day. It was always unlit and pitch black but the narrow and steep stairway had but a single exit point to my friends Steve and Gary's rear door. No one really ever used those stairs. There was no light source in the cramped stairwell, so consequently, it was cloaked in an opaque pitch blackness. I felt fairly confident they would be home, as they rarely ever left their apartment. 
One of them surely had to be there, and they would have a phone. So now, I had a plan. I bolted into the bedroom and began to open the old wood-framed window, trying to be as quiet as possible, while the wood complained around the pane of glass in its center. Great. The window was raised, and it was time to take out the old wood-framed screen from the window sash, without making a sound. It came free from its confines with a pretty audible scrape. Oh, God. It was the hardest thing I had to do, launching myself out the window into the blackness cloaking the house, into the untidy shrubbery beneath. My heart pounded in my ears. It seemed so loud that anyone nearby could clearly hear it thump, thump, thumping away. Trying to control the rushing blood and heat in my body, I held my breath, hoping the madman was not in these bushes and had not registered the soft thud and rustling of the bushes I'd made as I landed. I felt exposed outside, but I swallowed my terror down. I then made a mad dash around to the back, running and stumbling up those steep stairs in the dark. I knocked on my friend's door, praying they would hear me and answer my cries, and oh please be fast, I thought, before he discovers me. After what had to be the longest wait of my life, then I heard Steve asking who was out there in a curious tone, obviously because no one ever used that stairway. I whispered through the door, It's me, Sandra. Let me in. There's someone outside threatening to hurt me. Steve opened the door immediately, a confused and surprised expression on his kind face. I jumped inside practically, almost knocking him flat in the doorway. I then locked the deadbolt latch. Catching my breath a little, I shakily told my friend what was going on. Wasting no time, he dialed 911 and explained the situation, providing the address. We waited silently in the apartment for the police to arrive, and I remained wide-eyed in total fear. To my surprise, a short time later, the police were knocking on my friend's door. They informed me the man was captured hiding in the bushes under my front window. They were familiar with this man, too. He'd apparently escaped from some institute nearby, and they'd been looking for him. That was part of his life without parole sentence he'd had, because he was apparently a convicted assaulter, I will say, of a particular kind. I was so shocked as I stared at the officer. I had no idea this man could have been stalking me for some time before I'd ever seen him. That was typical M.O. selecting a victim. I asked the officer why they didn't inform the public about his escape, to which I never received a direct response. When I was a young child, I was not one of those children who were afraid of monsters. They just didn't seem scary to me. Well, that has changed now, and if you were to ask me if I believe in monsters these days, my response would be very much yes. The Regrettable Shortcut From Laurel G I'm a female, and when I was 16, I lived in the Valley area of Los Angeles. This was many years ago. At the time, the best part of my week was Saturday nights, when I would meet my friends at our beloved Under 21 nightclub to dance the night away. Eventually, I got the great idea that since I'm there every week anyway, I may as well work there. All I had to do was ask the manager, and I had the prestigious job of snack bar cashier. It took me just a couple of hours to realize my mistake. If I work there, I can't dance and laugh and have fun. But I had made a commitment, so for the next several weeks at least, I was working there, not dancing. The vast majority of the Saturday nights that I went to the club, I'd have to get a ride there and back. It usually wasn't too difficult. I didn't have my own car until a couple years later, when I was in college. But on occasion, a family friend of ours would lend me his little blue Toyota. And on the Saturday night of this story, he did. I felt so independent and free to be able to take myself to and from the club. On the night of this story, I drove to the club and had a relatively good time, serving sodas and dancing with my group of friends during my break 
to music by Prince, Michael Jackson, and Earth, Wind, and Fire. At the end of the night, I got into my borrowed car and headed toward home. For those who don't know, the San Fernando Valley is made up of many suburban towns. None are really small, some are very nice, and as you'd expect, some are less nice, with higher crime. I lived with my family in a medium area, in the northern part of the valley. It was neither very nice nor very bad, with middle-class homes on mostly respectable, if not professionally manicured lawns. And being the greater Los Angeles County area, there were many deferring routes I could take to get home, whether freeways, highways, or city streets. It was after midnight at the time, most routes I could take at the moment would be bustling on a Saturday night. I'd had my fill of loud music, laughter, and chattering voices as I headed home, so I opted for a quieter route. I took some major busy streets, then veered into some quiet neighborhoods that I could cut through to get home. I figured if I drove through some quiet house-lined streets, no traffic nor stoplights, I'd get home a little faster, and I was tired. GPS built into your car wasn't a thing at the time, and if it was, it was nowhere near common, and cell phones weren't a thing, so I had to rely on maps, or just knowing the chosen route. I'd heard bad things about an area called Pacoima, but I'd only been through it during the day, maybe once. Still, I knew how to get through to shave a few minutes off my time. And besides, being someone used to walking or taking buses, I felt blissfully, perfectly safe in a well-running car with gas in the tank. I was safer in this moment than at almost any other time. At least, that's what I believed. Still, I was a teenage girl, alone after midnight in an area I was pretty unfamiliar with, and naive enough to think nothing bad could happen to me in a locked car. I entered a very dark residential area in Pacoima. I only had to go north a couple blocks to get to the next town, then to my own. As I slowly drove down a dark, quiet avenue of modest, slightly run-down homes, there were very few streetlights illuminating the unknown. On my right were some small, still houses, so sealed up and quiet I could almost imagine no one had ever lived there. On my left was a completely unlit neighborhood park. I thought of families playing there in the sunshine, but now in the pitch blackness, it looked very uninviting. I felt almost as though I were an observer in a theme park ride, looking at the attraction from the safety of the carriage, seatbelt, and all. I smiled to myself at the little thrill of seeing something spooky while I was perfectly safe. That's when I noticed some people walking down the deserted street toward me. While this was the first sign of life I'd seen in quite some time, at first I didn't give it much thought. My left turn out of Pacoima was coming up, just past the park anyway. But as they got closer, I very quickly realized it wasn't just a few people. This was a group of approximately 8 to 12 young men, probably in their early 20s. And they were not casually walking down the sidewalk. No, they were aggressively running down the middle of the street and right towards me, the only moving car around. I suddenly had to slow to almost a stop as to not hit anyone, and this is when they all got a real good look at me. Looks which turned instantly more excited and animated as they realized I was a young girl all alone. Some of them exchanged smiling glances Others were whooping, whistling, and calling out things to me, like, Hey, little lady, come out and play, or, Babe, I can treat you real good. Smoothly, effortlessly, as if they'd rehearsed ahead of time, several of them stopped me completely by standing right in front of my car, putting their hands on the hood. All the while, others walked around to my driver's side and passenger side doors, they unapologetically pulled at the handles, trying to open the doors. I didn't always lock the doors when I drove, and cars didn't have auto door locks back then. But I was thanking God that I'd had the foresight to do so on that night. Of course, it all happened very fast, 
but in my shock and terror, it felt like slow motion, adjusting my mind from carefree to possibly being abducted, or worse, by this large group of men. For what felt like several minutes, I just sat there, no longer feeling safe. I realized it would just take one easily broken window and I would be at their mercy. And they did not appear very merciful. They seemed more like a gang of hungry tomcats drooling over a tiny mouse. They had me trapped. I couldn't drive forward nor reverse out of there because at the time the car was completely surrounded by these men and when I saw a couple of the guys picking up rocks or other objects to probably try to break the windows, I knew I had to think clearly and act fast. I did the only thing I could think of. I made the knee-jerk decision that I was going to drive through them and they would just have to get out of the way or pay for it. Showing no hesitation once my decision was made, I began to drive forward. Having blocked my car completely, I could see the surprise on some of their faces as they realized they quickly had to move out of the way or risk being run over. All the men standing in front of the car managed to jump out of the way, and I sped up, taking the left turn out of Pacoima. I didn't even check the rear view as I heard some of them running after me, yelling angrily. About 15 minutes later, I did make it home safely, but my heart didn't stop beating out of my chest for the remainder of the night. Of course, I thought about it for a long time afterward. I felt proud of the way I'd handled the situation, but of course I'd learned a hard lesson, and I kicked myself for my stupidity. I kept running through possibilities of what could have happened. What if they didn't get out of the way, and I actually had to hit someone with the car? How would I have lived with myself? What if one of the men had pointed a gun at me or gotten a window broken? What if one of them had a car nearby and chased me home? I'm very happy that it turned out the way it did because it could have been much, much worse. I hope we'll all keep in mind that we're not invincible inside a car. No matter how safe and cozy our heated leather seats are, dark, quiet shortcuts are not a good idea, especially late at night and always drive with your doors locked. The Koima gang that tried to grab and do who knows what to a teenage girl, driving alone late one Saturday night. It's been a long time since then, and I'm very glad we didn't become better acquainted. Unexplained Activity in the Museum From Victoria C. This story takes place in October of 2021, when I worked at a small municipal museum in Colorado. I'd been selected for a museum technician role to help process a backlogged archaeological collection. After reflecting on the events that occurred, my supervisor and I thought there may be two different occurrences that happened. One had to do with the building itself, and one with a newly acquired doll with an interesting backstory. The museum was not in a standalone building, but rather a small wing of the old city hall. There was a lot of back and forth by the city to decide whether to sell the building or preserve it. This meant that any reparative work on the building was halted, and some of the building was partially gutted or unusable. It looked like a scene out of the early 90s with outdated furniture, peeling paint, and flickering lights. The museum was in a small wing composed of several different rooms on the first floor, and on certain days, there was a receptionist who worked in the lobby. There were a few local businesses that operated on the second floor, but it would often feel very empty and quiet despite that. I'm the type who likes to start work early, and often would arrive around 7.30 a.m., turning all the lights on. One by one, I would turn them on, realizing I was the only one in the building. I would unlock the door to the museum wing and begin setting up for my day of work. To be honest, it could be unnerving, especially because I would hear creaks in the floor above me sometimes. But I would make it out to be the draft in the building, or perhaps an employee from one of the small businesses on the second floor who was in the break room making coffee. I would always feel a sense of relief when I heard one of my two co-workers walk in. 
One day I arrived, and my supervisor, Brittany, was already there. She looked at me and told me that something happened to her the day prior. She said she stayed later than usual, and it was just her and the receptionist. Brittany then heard loud and pronounced footsteps on the floor above her in our office. So pronounced that the ceiling paneling was showing signs of movement or weight depressions as well. Brittany went into the lobby and asked the receptionist if she had heard anything and if everyone else was gone for the day. The receptionist said she had heard sounds from the second floor, but to the best of her knowledge, there was no one in the building anymore. It seemed Brittany was most rattled by the actual vibrations and depressions in the ceiling panels. Nothing else happened that evening. The area above the museum wing was a very large conference room that had a small kitchenette attached to it. This large conference room was never used for anything and was always empty, so sometimes I would eat my lunch up there alone. I noticed it was frequently very cold there, but I figured it was because the windows were old and let in drafts. The room had high-rise ceilings, and the heat distribution was likely not too great because of that. The room also had large gold-framed portraits of men and various landscapes that looked way too fancy for what the building actually was. Eventually, I stopped eating there and ate in the old courtroom, which was even more abandoned looking. No matter how relaxed I tried to feel, I could never shake the feeling something was off, like I was being watched, or it was so cold everywhere regardless of which room I picked. It was that constant feeling of going through the hallways and feeling something could pop out from just around any corner. Brittany and I both agreed that something was happening on the second floor, but we weren't sure as to what exactly it was and why. Given the age of the building, it wasn't surprising, though. This was not the only occurrence Brittany had talked about. This next one involved an artifact. She had a lot more of these stories because she had been at the museum for nearly five years by then. It is important to note that the story of this artifact, a rag doll, starts at a local farmhouse. In this case, the city owned multiple cultural heritage sites, one of which was a historic farmhouse from the late 1800s to the early 1900s in a rural area of town. This farmhouse later became an archaeological site, where the museum would obtain this ragdoll, among other objects. A total of three families lived in this home, and it was believed the ragdoll belonged to a young woman of the first family to live there. She was the daughter of what I will call the Johnson family, from what I understand, she was not the most likable individual and a bit of a recluse. The modern-day descendants of the Johnson family from the early 1900s still lived in the area and would often try to influence the museum to make the narrative more about them and their familial history. The reports of this doll began to pick up after the latter two families moved to the farmhouse between the 1930s to 1950s. They shared instances of the doll moving around of its own volition. The attic was turned into a bedroom, and that's where the doll resided when the other two families moved in. Oftentimes, they would place the doll in one area of that room and find that the next day, it was in a completely different place. There are instances of thumping sounds coming from that area of the house as well. Brittany told me that both families ended up sleeping in the common living areas refusing to sleep in the upper bedroom where the doll was. That was the extent of what I was told about their experiences. But I imagined something uncomfortable enough would had to have happened to make people not use a perfectly usable bedroom. Keep in mind that the families that lived there after the Johnsons would have been around during both the Great Depression and the beginning of World War II. It's not unusual that much of the original furniture would have stayed in the home while they were there, since they were renting the place from the Johnsons. Their lives were hard at the time, because this was in a rural area, and it got quite cold in Colorado. The archaeologists found a lot of newspapers stuffed in between the floors and walls to help keep the building insulated. 
The farmhouse was excavated as an archaeological site post-2010. Currently, it is used as an educational and heritage site, where tours are conducted daily about the history of the home and the families that live there. Brittany told me that some of the tour guides told her that sometimes the frames on the walls would fall off, or items that were original to the home that were preserved would be found moved to different areas. There's a lot of lore to that farmhouse, and some believe it's the recluse daughter of the Johnson family that inhabits that doll. Some of the items original to the home remained a part of the educational experience for the tours. Some items were brought over to the museum to be processed and added to the collection. Brittany told me that she was aware of what people would say about this doll, and how it was believed the previous families in the 1930s up to the 1950s avoided it and the room it was in. When transporting the doll in her car between the farmhouse and the museum, she said she spoke to it very nicely, just in case it was active. I always appreciated that Brittany was open about her belief in the paranormal and the unexplained. It was refreshing and easy to talk to her about things going on in the building and with that doll. Luckily, at the time that I was there, nothing significant happened with the doll. She spoke to it nicely and put it in one of the collection storage closets lying face up. This closet had another room you had to go through, so it was almost double secure. This made me feel better when coming in for work and having to be alone, because there often were those creepy sensations of being alone before anyone else got into the building. I asked Brittany if she was okay if I could process that doll last, or not at all. As a museum professional, I wanted to ensure that I placed my professionalism above my superstition. It technically is not appropriate to decline to interact with an artifact because of hearsay. But something about this one artifact and the stories around its activity in the old farmhouse made me feel uncomfortable, so much so I asked to avoid working on it. Brittany agreed and said that she would even put it in the upstairs storage, even farther away which made me feel even better. Again, nothing ever happened with the doll while I worked there, but I do believe that the old building and some of those artifacts might have encouraged some of the unexplained activity. Thank you for listening to my story. I can truly relate to those who have encountered the unexplained and creepy at their places of work. I can't wait, because mine and Carmen Carrion's new book, Freaky Folklore, Terrifying Tales of the World's Most Elusive Monsters and Enigmatic Cryptids is coming July 16th, featuring the history and lore of terrifying folklore creatures from across the globe, alongside some cool and creepy illustrations. Pre-order today on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or your favorite bookstore, or go to eeriecast.com freak. The next 1,000 verified pre-orders will get a Freaky Folklore decal and a three-month subscription code to EerieCast Plus and all entrants will get a free PDF sneak peek of the Freaky Folklore book. To verify and for more info, go to eeriecast.com slash freak. Haunted Fairgrounds From Millie I have a handful of stories for you. The first two are from when I worked a summer job at a fair. This fair is always held in the same location, a sprawling set of grounds that is home to several buildings dating back to the early 1900s. I only preface this story with this because the entire place is known for its ghostly residents, most of which are credited to the battle that took place there during the war. I believe there was also a fire that wiped out a good portion of the city, and a few of the buildings on these grounds were used as temporary morgues. One summer, I was there ahead of opening day, I worked in the entertainment department, and part of my job was to go set up the various break rooms for all the various bands, actors, and other such guests that we would be hosting. My role was known as a runner. Oftentimes, our shifts would run late, and we'd be the only department on site left to get our various equipment around the park. This particular night, I was setting up one of the bunk rooms in the Horse Palace, this particular building was built in 1931 and has had a long-standing history of strange sightings. 
with enough stalls to house over a thousand horses and an arena with two floors, this building can be a bit of a maze to navigate. The first floor is now home to a riding school and the city's mounted police division. The second level is unused. It houses more stalls for horses and bunk rooms. The second level only gets used during the fair. So I was up there on the second floor, looking for one of the bunk rooms to set up for a band that was coming in a week to play at the fair. It was around 10 p.m. There were two police officers milling about the first floor. I'd had a chat with them earlier about the upcoming events, and I told them I would be in and out to set up the room upstairs. They told me they'd be hanging around, so they'd lock up after I left, since it was just the three of us there. I spent the next hour bringing a mini-fridge and other items up to the room, leaving it all in the hallway as it took a couple of trips. Now the doors to all these rooms haven't been updated. They all have the original locks still, which are all skeleton key style locks. It was getting pretty late at this point, and I was maybe in a rush trying to get this door open, but for some reason it wasn't catching. I guess my fussing had drawn the attention of someone, as a man came up from behind me and tapped me on the shoulder. That one's always tricky, he said, as I jumped and turned to look at him. It wasn't one of the police officers from downstairs. This man was dressed in blue jean overalls, boots, and had one of the old caps on. You know, the ones that slouch forwards over a small brim, like the newsy hats. He looked dirty from a long day of mucking stalls and smelled a bit like it too. I remember thinking he must be one of these stable hands, and he just stayed late to clean up for the school downstairs. Maybe he'd heard the noise I was making with the keys and came to investigate. I asked if he knew how to get it open, or maybe I was just being an idiot and had used the wrong key. He assured me that I had it right. I just had to give it a little bump from the bottom to make it hit the tumblers just right. He mimed the motion, showing me what he meant. I followed his instructions, and I felt the tumblers click into place. The door swung open, finally. I thanked him for the help, and he replied, No problem. I've been dealing with these doors for years now. Just little tricks. With that, he turned to leave, heading down the hallway towards the ramp that led downstairs. I went about dragging all the stuff into the room, setting it up, and quickly locking back up before leaving. On my way downstairs, I ran into one of the police officers, thanking them for letting me finish up. We joked a bit about the late night of work, and then I said, At least I'm not the only one running about here so late. I guess that other guy left ahead of me. The officer gave me a weird look that he shared with his partner, and shook his head. Nah, it was just you up there. I insisted that I'd spoken with the man who had helped me unlock the door. I explained the whole thing, and they assured me that no, I was the only one up on the second level. I felt the bottom drop out of my stomach as I laughed it off nervously and said he must have gone out one of the other doors. I think at this point they were humoring me as they agreed, though they did say they would do another sweep of the building to make sure everyone had indeed gone home before they left. I took off pretty quickly. I headed back to my boss's office. It was well after 10 p.m. at this point, and the building that houses all the offices was locked up already for the night. So I took the ring of skeleton keys home with me for the night. Not something I would ordinarily do, but this leads me into my second story. We never stayed in the press building after 10 p.m. The press building is where all the offices for the various departments that run the fair are. It was built in 1904 and was one of the first permanent buildings built for the fair's use. Each department has its offices in here, and ours were on the first floor tucked in the back corner. It's a three-story building, though the basement is really just a set of washrooms. The first floor is all offices, plus a kitchen, and the second floor is more offices as well as a second washroom. I worked at this fair for eight years total. It got me through high school and university. My department's offices were on the first floor, and for as long as I'd worked there, we always had one rule. 
you don't stay in the press building after 10 p.m. For the first couple of years, I just thought it was a security thing. It made sense after all. So, when my boss and I were there late one night, it was about two weeks before the fair opened. We were going through the contracts for all the actors we were hiring for the summer, making sure we had all of the break rooms assigned for them. Then we realized what time it was. My manager, I'll call her Angie, had only been there for a year at this point. She was basically new, and this was her first fair. So, when I pointed out the time, she glanced at the clock and shrugged. We still have more to go through. We can push through for another hour. Oh, well, I just thought they locked up at 10, I said, as I'd never actually been in the office so late. No, I have the keys. I was told we could just lock up before we left, she said, ending my argument. Though it was around this point that we decided we both needed a bathroom break, so I got up and went to go use the one in the basement. It was a single toilet bathroom that was basically in a closet at the bottom of a narrow set of stairs. So as I headed down, she went up to the one upstairs. I was in the middle of doing my business when I heard footsteps above me, going down the stairs. I thought nothing of it. I assumed she had finished before I did. I finished up and that's when I heard the footsteps going back up the stairs. Again, maybe she had needed to do something else up there. I washed my hands and went back up the main landing. I peered upstairs and called out for Angie. I got no response. So I waited there. This isn't a huge building, but it was late at night and dark. We only had our office lights on, so I wanted to wait for her to join me before we navigated the cubicles back to our space. As I stood at the bottom of the stairs, I heard footsteps above me again walking down the long hallway on the second floor. Once more, I called for Angie. That's when I heard a second set of footsteps quickly jogging down the hall towards the stairs. Angie came running down the steps, almost barreling into me. I asked her if she was all right. It took her a minute before she nodded slowly, glancing back up the staircase. She said she thought she'd heard someone outside the bathroom while she was in it she could hear pacing footsteps in the hallway. She'd heard me call earlier, but she said she was busy holding her breath, trying not to make a sound as she heard someone stop outside the bathroom door. She had originally thought I'd come up to look for her, but when I'd called out, she realized I was still downstairs. She said she didn't leave the bathroom until she'd heard the footsteps move away, at which point she had bolted out of there. I tried to calm her down, telling her that maybe it was the cleaning crew. Maybe we had just missed seeing them come in to clean for the night. This was a rational explanation after all, and we both agreed that's who it must have been. We went back to our office to finish up what we were doing. Now, before I explain what happened next, I want to be very clear. Our office is one of the only ones with a door to it, which we lock every time we leave. We keep a lot of cash on hand in there, along with all the keys for the rental SUVs and limos that we used to go pick up the bands from the airports. There's also no window in our office. It's a dark hole that us entertainment types don't really mind at all. So when we unlocked the door to go back in and saw our stack of papers spread around the entire room, I mean sheets of contracts everywhere, on the chairs, all over the desk, all over the floor, everywhere... We both shared a look, grabbed our purses, and agreed to call it an early night. We locked our office back up, leaving the mess, and each of us left. As we were heading out the side door of the building, we heard more footsteps coming down the stairs, heading in our direction. I've never pushed my way out of a door faster than I did that night as we closed it and locked it behind us. Neither of us looked through the security glass in the door, to see if we were right about the cleaners or not. We didn't want to know. The next morning, when we asked our boss about it, she had been working there for 31 years. She laughed and said she told us not to stay past 10 p.m. No one stayed past 10 p.m. 
we never brought that night up again. It wasn't until recently when my mother thought it would be fun to do a ghost tour that was being held on these grounds that I'd had these stories validated. The tour guide was telling us about the horse palace as we walked up the ramp to the second level. She told us about a man who had died there in the late 40s. He had been a stable hand. He was working on the second level and had, for some reason or another, leaned over the railing that looked down into the open area. As she told it, he fell and tragically passed away from his injuries. As she was telling this story, we were stopped near that room that I'd set up several years ago and where I'd met that man. I felt a cold chill run through me when I asked if there was any information about him, what he looked like or anything of the sort. She said they had a couple of photos of the staff from back then. I described the man I'd seen and she nodded. Yeah, that sounds like him. How'd you know? I haven't worked at the fairground in seven years. I've since found another job working at a different type of fairground. The place I work at now is not nearly as haunted, but we do have our fair share of friendly ghosts that like to keep us on our toes. Those are probably stories for another day, and I'll happily share them with you if you'd like to hear. It seems ghosts love to hang out around the fun as much as we do. Paranormal Encounters on Patrol From Michigan Deputy I'm a sheriff's deputy in the state of Michigan. Last year I submitted the story, I've Seen the Face of Evil, which boasted some of the most intense calls I'd responded to during my career so far. Since then, well, the paranormal has weaseled its way into the stories of my career. I've made new friends that had paranormal experiences at work, and I had one of my own. I've been working for a sheriff's office on the west side of the state for just over a year now. The area I work is just outside a major metropolitan area, which is very diverse. The section of the county I cover ranges from high crime, lower income areas, to open rural areas with one small town in the middle of it all. That small town has its own police department, though it only consists of about seven police officers for a 24-hour patrol. Not much happens in this town, but when it rains, it pours. I've become good friends with the officer for this town that works the same night shift as me. The town is historical. It has a fair share of landmarks with historical plaques and still runs on the same economy that started the town way back when, the river. As we all know, with history sometimes comes spirits. For anonymity's sake, I will not be naming locations or people included in these stories. My friend E has had many encounters with the paranormal while at work. To start with, the town hall and police station have been in the same building since the late 1800s, and I don't think that will change anytime soon. According to E, the old mayor from the 1920s still hangs around the building. He showed me one day the metal detector that used to be standing just inside the entrance to the town hall. When he showed it to me, it was taken apart and shoved in a storage closet. It was a good idea at the time, making sure none of the town's residents decided to bring weapons into town hall. But they had to take it down when it would go off at night by itself. And it didn't go off once or twice, it went off several times every night, when no one was in the office. And it was always right around 2 or 3 in the morning. E has also seen the supposed spirit of the old mayor walking around the office around the same time of night. Doors will open and close by themselves, lights will turn on and off around the office, all while no one is there. E has witnessed this firsthand while inside the building alone, but has also seen this recorded on surveillance footage inside the building when it's completely empty. The next anecdote from E is even more terrifying. There is a local legend around another historical village some ways away from the small town my friend works for. This legend is a variation of the woman in white. The story goes that a bride absconded from her wedding 
leaving the groom at the altar. It was an arranged marriage of sorts in the early 1900s, and the woman refused to marry the man her father chose. The bride was found by the groom in a nearby cemetery, and, in a fit of rage, the groom killed his would-be bride for deserting him. The legend goes the bride still haunts the cemetery and surrounding area to this very day, looking for revenge on the man that killed her. Unfortunately for E, he was called to assist the sheriff's office in looking for a missing juvenile in the area of the cemetery one night. Yet again, around 2 a.m., E was parked in the cemetery with the windows of his patrol car down, with his floodlights on looking for the child. All was quiet. Nothing was moving or stirring, no sounds of wildlife, just the noises of the river in the distance. He was concentrating, trying to pick up on any sound or movement that might indicate the missing child was close. Suddenly, there was a loud, piercing scream. It was as if a woman was standing less than a foot away from his driver's side door, bellowing. My friend jumped out and looked around, but there was no one there. Nothing to show that anyone had been there at all. He booked it out of the cemetery and returned to the small town, opting to deal with the old mayor rather than the village witch that supposedly stalks that cemetery. E's experience happened about three years back, but just one month ago, a couple of my shift mates decided to go to that cemetery with a spirit box app. They pulled in, parked their cars, and just stood outside for a few minutes. They watched the app to see if anything popped up. When nothing did, they started to ask general questions to see if any spirits were around. They got some general responses indicating some friendly spirits were in the area but nothing that indicated the witch was nearby. They waited a little bit longer, discussing other things like sports and movies. After about an hour, they decided maybe the whole thing was a farce and were just about to leave. But then the spirit box chirped. There was a new word on the screen. Witch. According to my two co-workers, they had not spoken of anything about a witch that night, or tried to coax it out before this word appeared. They drove away from there as fast as they could. Now then, that brings me to my one paranormal experience from this past year. I was backing up my friend E on a complaint of someone supposedly breaking into the old abandoned school in the small town. It was right along the river, just like everything else historical in the town. E and I found a point of entry among the boarded up doors and windows. We crawled inside, turning on our flashlights, beginning to walk around the building. At one point I turned to him and said this looked exactly like something out of an episode of Ghost Hunters. He laughed, but agreed, stating there was a rumor of the building being haunted. He said some people claimed that was the real reason the building shut down. We'd only been walking for about five minutes when I thought I saw movement in the shadows at the end of the hall. I shone my flashlight beam, stopping in my tracks to listen closely. My friend and I then heard what sounded like a chair moving in the room right next to us. We walked through the double doors finding ourselves standing in the gymnasium. We shone our flashlights around and didn't see nor hear anything. Then, right as I was standing still, shining my flashlight aimlessly, the beam fell across an old metal desk chair near the center of the gym. It moved. It didn't go far, but it definitely moved. We heard it scrape against the wood floor. We saw it move about six inches or so, and we also saw absolutely nothing near it whatsoever. The two of us ran as fast as we could out of there, declaring no one had broken into the school. We guessed whoever called this in, maybe a neighbor living nearby, saw the shadow of whatever was inside that building and called us, thinking it was a person. 
but I can assure you there were no living humans inside that old school that night. Well, except for me and E. Night Shift brings its own variety of interesting calls and nightly encounters. None are as terrifying as the threats that you can't see and frankly can't understand. Humans can be scary, but to me, the paranormal is scarier. Stay safe, everyone. It Stood Still From Fiber Forester I gotta tell you about the freakiest thing that ever happened to me. I'm really into nature photography. I even make some cash from it on the side. Well, last summer, I decided to head out to Zion National Park to get some shots of the local birds. I figured I'd make a weekend of it, so I drove my truck out there with my camper attachment on the bed. I got there in the late afternoon, found a nice secluded spot to set up camp. I spent a few hours hiking around and snapping photos until the sun started to go down. I had a quick dinner, then decided to call it a night. I climbed into my tent in the back of the truck, placing my keys and other things beside me, and dozed off. Sometime in the middle of the night, nature called, if you know what I mean. I groggily crawled out of the tent and headed a little ways away from the campsite to take care of my business. I was still half asleep, and it was pitch black out there in the woods. All of a sudden, I heard a stick snap beside me somewhere. I whipped my head around toward the sound, and I swear to God, I saw the most bone-chilling thing I've ever laid eyes on. There, perfectly framed between two trees, was the silhouette of something. It looked vaguely human-shaped, but it was way too tall, about seven or eight feet, and it was far too thin to be a normal person. What looked like its arms were freakishly long, like longer than I am tall, and I couldn't make out any hair or clothes or anything, just the black shape of this thing. For a second, I thought I must be seeing things. Maybe it was a weird tree catching the moonlight in a strange way. But then, as I began to take my gaze off of it, trying to make sense in my head of what I just saw. The silhouette began to move. For the brief moment, my eyes had turned away. Slowly, steadily, that thing began taking long strides in my direction, like it was trying to sneak up on me. I was horrified. My brain kept trying to rationalize it. A tree, a shadow, my tired eyes playing tricks. But I knew then, this thing was moving. My eyes shot back towards it, and at the same time, its movement stopped. I wasn't hallucinating anything, because it was closer than it was before, so it had to have moved. Then I heard the sound, this awful, raspy, wheezing sound, like something struggling to breathe and also trying to hide the sound. It was coming from the direction of that silhouette. At this point, I was freaking out inside, but trying my best not to show it. For some reason, I did not want this thing to know that I knew it was there. So I turned back around, facing forward, pretending I hadn't seen anything. But I kept watching from the corner of my eye. About 10 seconds later, it began to move again taking those same quiet, creeping, deliberate steps towards me. I couldn't take it anymore. I spun around, and the silhouette froze once more. My voice cracking in terror, I yelled out, I, I, see, you. I see you! The thing didn't react. It was like someone had pressed the pause button and left it there. But the wheezing breaths continued louder than before, maybe because it was closer again. I was covered in goosebumps, every hair on my body standing up on end. I stared at that black silhouette, trying to force my eyes to see more details, to pick up some clue as to what this thing could possibly be. 
but there was just the unnerving shape and those awful rasping sounds. I don't even really remember deciding to run. Suddenly, my legs were just pumping, tearing through the underbrush back to my campsite in a wild, clumsy, desperate sprint. I practically dove into the cab of my truck, frantically searching for my keys before remembering I'd laid them down in the tent attachment. There was no way in heck I was going back out there. I knew I couldn't reach them through the rear window because the dang thing had been jammed shut since I bought the truck. So I just locked the doors, turned on the engine to blast the radio, flipped on every light I had, and I hunkered down to wait for dawn. I sat there, rigid, clutching my pocket knife, jumping at every nighttime sound I heard outside, until finally, the first rays of sun started to brighten the sky. As soon as it was light enough to see, I bolted from the cab, snatched my keys, and got the heck out of there. I didn't bother lowering my tent attachment, which had to be raised when you used it. I was so rattled after these events, I didn't go camping or on any photography trips in the wild for a full year. I kept thinking about that silhouette, lurking in the dark. I've never been so deeply scared in my life. I still don't know what to make of it. I've heard about skinwalkers and wendigos and other creepy legends out there in the wilderness of the Southwest, but I never put much stock in that stuff until that night. Now, I don't know what to believe. All I know is I came face to face with something out there in those woods, something in Zion National Park, something that didn't move like any human or animal I've ever seen. Whatever that pale, gaunt, and deeply unnatural thing was, I'm glad I got away from it. Be careful out there. You never know what you might see in the dark. Tales from the Break Room is a viewer-submitted podcast featuring allegedly true scary stories that happened on the way to, on the way from, or at work. If you want your story to be narrated on the show, send it to us at eeriecast.com slash submit. As of April 14th, we're paying three cents per word for stories that are approved and make it onto the show. Submission does not guarantee approval or payment. For a limited time only, PayPal only. Tales from the Break Room is an EerieCast Network original podcast hosted by Darkness Prevails. You can follow him on Twitter at Dark Prevails, and you can hear thousands more stories read by him on our other show, Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed this episode, please follow and rate Tales from the Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You can also enjoy plenty more horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com. <laughs>